Few weapons command as much respect as the aircraft carrier. They are the largest surface warships ever built and are the symbols of the modern age of war. And yet, they have a secret. One of their most critical systems is not our invention, but a remnant from the ancient world. In fact, ancient military technology was more advanced and lethal than we think. Flamethrowers with the power to destroy cities. Chemical weapons sprayed directly into the mouths of attacking cavalry troops. Horses turned into living torpedoes. Prototype catapults and all-terrain technology still used by today's special forces. By decoding ancient texts, building full-scale working prototypes, and using futuristic 3D holograms, the lost secrets of the ancient world are brought to light. Impossible Army Machines is our ancient discovery. That's got to be one of the most successful experiments I've ever done for ancient discoveries. The multiple rocket launcher can fire 10 rounds per second. It belongs firmly on the modern battlefield. But researchers have discovered a mysterious reference to a missile launcher from the ancient world with a rate of fire that is almost as high. And this one is nearly 2,000 years old. Lost and forgotten within ancient Chinese texts is an obscure reference to a multiple launch catapult with a rate of fire of over eight rounds per second. Could the ancient Chinese people have invented a weapon that could challenge the modern rocket launcher? In 200 AD, ancient China was a nation at war with itself. Governors went to great lengths to protect their subjects from attack. The Chinese had always been very good at building fortified cities which is one reason why they had to devote such enormous resources to the problem of destroying or defeating these defenses. Siege warfare in the ancient world involved wearing down the enemy. This trebuchet takes a full 20 minutes to reload. How could the ancients speed up the reloading process to give a much higher rate of fire? A text written by the ancient inventor Ma Zhang in 232 AD describes a prototype for a catapult that had the highest rate of fire of any in the ancient world. According to the historical accounts, you have a very large wooden flywheel. And once you've set it in motion, the centrifugal force throws out the missiles on the end of a piece of rope. As each missile reaches the top of the wheel, a knife blade cuts through the rope, leaving the missile free to fly forward. But could the prototype have actually worked? With no knowledge of how or where the weapon was used, if at all, ancient technology specialist Richard Windley is piecing together the machine and has built a scale model of it to see if it could have worked. This is another of these pieces, really, which we've only got vaguest of textual references to. Ma Zhang does not specify what missiles would be used in the machine. But as rate of fire was its most important feature, archaeologists assume the missiles would be relatively cheap to produce and be made of simple stone, moving at great speeds at a very high rate of fire. The first test is with a single stone. On this model, because of the size, we've got to actually generate quite high speeds. The larger the wheel, the slower it would need to rotate. So if you had a 20 or 30 foot wheel, we'd probably only want maybe one revolution a second. Richard is intending to get the wheel up to three revolutions per second, which will project the balls at 80 miles per hour. The first shot is powerful, but the range is short, a mere 50 feet. Two things there. We, we managed to get a fair speed up. Uh, the knife successfully actually cut through the rope, which was one of the things we were slightly concerned about. But it did look as though the point of cutting was too early. It looks as though it's actually hurling it into the ground. So it looks as though we've got to have a rethink on the actual position of the knife blade. Time to get out the toolbox. Richard needs to move the angle of the blade so that it cuts the ropes earlier, so releasing balls into a higher and therefore longer trajectory. With the angle of the blade altered backwards, 
Richard arms the catapult to its full launch capability, eight six-pound iron missiles. We got a lot more range that time, and it seems to be kind of thrown it up in the air slightly more. Eight six-pound balls traveling at 80 miles an hour deliver 16 kilojoules of energy. In terms of the mechanics, it's, it seems like a sound idea. If we scale this thing up to the sort of size that um, Majun was reputed to have used, you know, we're, we're in with a viable possibility of a weapon, I think. The investigation has shown that the catapult could have been effective if it had been used. The Chinese were very meticulous about keeping records of these sort of inventions. And there are numerous military manuals published from the 11th century onwards, which illustrate an enormous variety of catapults. So the fact that this one does not appear in these later manuals strongly suggests that it was never used. The main problem seems to be that the framework and the base was so heavy that it would be impossible once it was set up to alter the aim of it. Each time you chose a different target, the whole device would have to be moved and reset up, which would be a fairly mammoth task. Occasionally, researchers come across evidence of ancient weapons as good as a modern blueprint. One of these has been recovered from ancient Greece, and it describes a machine that, while innovative, utilizes man's most primeval fear. Fire is one of the primary weapon systems used even in the 21st century. You set a man on fire, and he's out of the firing line. Once that man is burning, he's out of the line, and so are his mates, because they want to put him out before he, he starts to hurt. The earliest known machine to employ the deadly power of fire dates back over 2,000 years, and it was used not only against troops, but the fabric of an entire city. In 424 BC, a tribe known as the Boeotians put this power to great effect. They were laying siege to the town of Delium in central Greece to win it back from the Athenians. The defenders had thrown together a lot of wood and roots and all kinds of material to bind up a, an earthen defense. For the Boeotians, all that wood stacked up within the Athenian walls made the choice of attack weapon obvious. They come up with a flamethrower, quite a big flamethrower. How could such a weapon system have been possible? And was it enough to defeat the Athenians? Clues were recorded by the ancient writer Thucydides. Thucydides is an Athenian general and statesman who gets sacked about halfway through the Peloponnesian War. And like most generals who get sacked halfway through a war, he wants to prove that they shouldn't have sacked him. So he sits down to do something unusual. He writes a book. And his book is the first serious political examination of the phenomenon of war, not as something to write legends about, but something that happens to real people. It really is a rich and powerful text that we still read to this day. They sawed in two and hollowed out a great beam, which they then joined together again very exactly, like a flute, and suspended a vessel by chains at the end of the beam. The iron mouth of a bellows directed downwards into the vessel was attached to the beam, of which a great part was itself overlaid with iron. This machine they brought up from a distance on carts to various points of the rampart. And when it was quite near the wall, they applied a large bellows to their own end of the beam and blew through it. The blast passed into the vessel, which contained burning coals and sulfur and pitch. These made a huge flame and set fire to the rampart so that no one could remain on it. Because of the detailed description left by Thucydides, Richard is able to build one of the most accurate reconstructions he has ever made. It's a very, very simple device. Large bellows, big long tube, fire pot on the end. The bellows will blow it a bit like a blacksmith's fire. We could raise the temperature probably two or threefold with a good direction of air into the pot. At first, the flamethrower does not appear to be very effective. But as the oxygen from the nozzle passes over the combustibles, things start to heat up. Eventually, Richard can produce a directional heat source capable of delivering fire right into the walls of a city. 
Once or twice, when we just got the angle correct, I think um, we were getting very, very intense heat. We were getting almost a white heat, which is, which is really quite hot. White flame is only produced by temperatures over 1,000 degrees. If we think that this design was something like 2,500 years old, um, you know, this, was, this is quite impressive technology for the time. The wooden walls of Delium would have provided little comfort for the defending troops. According to Thucydides, the Boeotians used this weapon to set fire to Delium and chase away the Athenians. Only about 200 Athenians were killed. The rest were allowed to escape. Using technology that was way beyond its time, the Boeotians managed to defeat the mighty Athens, a true testament to the power of engineering. But despite this, Athens went on to become one of the most powerful cities in the ancient world and is still the capital of Greece today, 3,000 years later. From the soaring ambition of the repeating catapult to the ingenious application of a basic resource like fire, military engineering has developed over millennia to produce the most terrifying and powerful technologies man can dream of. But these innovations were just the beginning. The modern aircraft carrier can't do its job without an essential piece of hardware that is 2,000 years old. In a message fragment from ancient Egypt, a deadly long-range weapon is described that worked using only the power of air. The modern aircraft carrier, the ultimate weapon of war, uses a technology on every operation that was developed in ancient Egypt over 2,000 years ago. How is this possible? Ancient technology expert Richard Windley is investigating a forgotten ancient text about the origins of this simple but powerful technology. In the ancient world, the catapult was the technological front runner of the arms race. It had the ability to store and release far more energy than a single man could possibly unleash. The stored energy is known as potential energy. Nearly all throwing devices use the same operating principle. They convert potential energy into kinetic energy. And the potential energy is either stored in some form of elastic, be it twisted rope or elastic bands in the form of a handheld catapult. A trebuchet stores the energy in gravity by having the weights held up high. And all that happens is that you then release the potential energy and convert that into the kinetic energy that's in the missile. The standard catapult in the ancient world was the torsion catapult. Torsion catapult works by twisting up fibers which can retain energy while cocking the mechanism so that the arms of the catapult are actually linked up to the torsion and the trigger then releases all of that energy by unwinding whatever you've wound up. The materials used would be animal sinew, hemp, and stretched leather. Using only organic fibers, a common torsion heavy catapult in the Roman army could unleash 2.5 megajoules of potential energy, enough power to shoot a 300-pound missile over a third of a mile. But in 280 BC, in the city of Alexandria on the Egyptian coast, a new science that would change the world was in its infancy. Once you go to using iron, it's a non-perishable material. You get a more reliable performance. You're not dealing with perishable sinews, hemp fibers. These are things that are going to deteriorate quite quickly in use. The ability to work metal to precision allowed the creation of airtight seals in pneumatic systems. We all now take, in the modern world, pneumatics for granted. All the buses and trucks that people travel in, um, they all have pneumatic brakes. Message fragments from ancient Egypt hint at the ambition to harness this power for war. The idea that somebody then harnessed pneumatics to make a, a missile firing device really stand out as a, as a bit of sort of advanced thinking at the time. Today, Scientists can use these ancient references to construct a model of the machine 2,000 years after it saw the light of day. The design shows one of the first pistons in history. The piston used by Tisibius is the first example of a piston. 
uh, and if we can see one here, it's basically a cylinder with a loose end. And as we move the end in and out, you can see that it compresses the gas inside. When we compress the gas, the molecules of air are being forced close together, the pressure is increased, and they're desperate to get away from each other. This creates a force acting on the piston, trying to return it to its original position. If we release the piston, you can see that it pops straight back out. But will an early piston have enough power to launch a missile? Ancient technology expert Richard Windley has created a replica of a machine, first seen in the deserts of Egypt thousands of years ago. The arm from the piston comes out here, so that's the kind of thrust rod or connecting rod for the piston, and there's a large cam here which is connected to the actual arm of the catapult, which is pivoted a bit further back. As we pull the arms of the catapult, you can just see the cams operating and pushing in the pistons. This is compressing the air and it's given us effectively a kind of air spring. This is achieved using only the power of what is all around us, air. The catapult would have shot 14-inch bolts with a wooden shaft and iron tip. Fantastic, we actually hit the target first time. I was somewhat surprised, in fact, that um, we got the kind of range that we did. We were getting 40 or 50 yards range with this, and the arrows are flying very, very straight. The actual height or trajectory is, is a slightly more complex issue, but it would be quite easy to get used to one of these things and probably hit a target of a metre square at um, 60, 70 yards. But if it was such a success, why did piston catapult technology disappear from the history books for so many hundreds of years? Quite why they didn't use it, I think, is probably due to the fact that they had problems getting an air seal, and that is absolutely crucial. And, and that kind of um, unreliability in the field would, would make soldiers be very, very wary of it as a weapon. Had they perfected the air seal, the piston catapult would have gone on to be the elite catapult of the ancient world, capable of launching projectiles weighing several tons at an enemy, a feat that its descendant and the modern piston catapult does today. On an aircraft carrier, to launch a fighter plane, they use a steam cannon that actually fires the plane off the end of the aircraft carrier, and that really is sort of taking the idea into its final and most modern form. It gives us the capability to accelerate aircraft weighing 55,000 pounds from zero to 165 knots over a 300-foot distance in less than two and a half seconds. The principles explored by Tisibius save military lives every day. This is the front of the catapult. It's called the battery position. This is where the aircraft gets secured to the shuttle, which is attached to the rest of the catapult. Within the launching engine are its power cylinders that run the full length of the catapult. Within the cylinders are pistons that are linked to the shuttle, which are next to the aircraft. When you're ready to fire the catapult, it's a programmed opening of the launch valve, which admits steam into the cylinders, pushes the pistons forward. When it gets to the end of the power stroke, the aircraft is permitted to continue flying. The piston was an idea too good to abandon. But some ancient technologies were so bizarre, they seem utterly impractical. Ancient notebooks reveal a strange sketch of a horse. The horse has been one of the most potent weapons of history. For centuries, nothing evoked as much fear in a soldier as an enemy cavalry charge. Then, someone got the idea to attach two 20-foot spears. Did it turn the horse into a living torpedo or create a battlefield disaster? This working, not to mention living, prototype of an ancient weapon is baffling military historians. How was it supposed to be used? And was it a success or a battlefield failure? To investigate, researchers must look for the original surviving blueprints written by the machine's inventor. The Biblioteca Communal Library in Siena contains hundreds of pages of plans and notes by medieval military engineers. 
One of these was named Takola. Takola is clearly very inventive, did these two big manuscripts, really showing what he could do. You can open it up and you can say, ah, that's a picture of a machine in the landscape doing what it does. Mariano Takola was born in 1382, a time of constant war in Renaissance Italy. Many of Takola's drawings were genuine inventions designed to be used, such as the breathing apparatus and the keel breaker. Some of them were simply drawings done to showcase Takola's imagination and abilities as an artist. Some of them are like concept cars at motor shows, you know, they're sort of saying, well, you know, this is, this is advertising what you can do. The question facing us now is whether this drawing of a horse torpedo was a genuine blueprint for a weapon or nothing more than another drawing to add to Takola's portfolio. When we find information about potential weapon systems, and we have no idea whether they were used or not. We have to use our creative intelligence. We have to think, is this practical? Is this sensible? Is the person telling the story credible as a witness? There is only one way to solve the mystery. If all else fails, there's no, nothing wrong with building one and testing it. The starting point of the weapon is the horse. You've got 400 kilograms of horse, plus rider, plus armor. That's half a ton of weight traveling at 35 miles an hour. You get hit by that, you don't get up again. The horse has been terrifying enemy soldiers for as long as mankind has been in the saddle. When the ground shakes and there's that pounding of hooves, it's absolutely terrifying. But will the addition of two 20-foot spears onto this power driver bring strategic benefit to the weapon? We've come here to one of the last schools in Europe where they still train battle horses to try Tackler's equine torpedo. Here, horses are trained for stunts in action movies. Henry has been in over 1,000 action stunts. He's used to strange equipment and unusual behavior. But even he is nervous. Well, we've got the device on exactly how it's shown in the manuscript, but we're already running into problems. This is the most docile and peaceful war horse you'll ever find. But he's already uncomfortable with having these bars so close to his nose. If he moves his head, he's striking these, these trails. And down here, it's digging into the ground. Now, that's great on one hand, because it's stopping the horse backing up. We only want this to go forwards. We don't want him to ride back into our own army. But it's putting a barrier in front of his nose. To make this horse go towards the enemy, it's going to take something like a burning brand here, not something we're going to do. Horses rely on sight to guide them across the battlefield. Takola's weapon places a bar right across the horse's field of vision. A horse that can't see simply stops charging. It's deeply problematic. The whole thing will, will grind to a halt. The only potential for this device to work is if you're willing to sacrifice a horse. Now, in a time with no antibiotics, any horse injured in battle is going to die from infection. So they've got a supply of horses that they might be willing to throw away. Doing that, strapping this on, and then lighting a fire at the horse's backside, maybe you've got a weapon. It seems the horse is an effective weapon with no need of accessorizing. In the ancient world, nothing was more terrifying than a cavalry charge. It struck fear into the heart of every army. And as time wore on, inventors were forced to seek newer, more advanced means of stopping an attacking cavalry. Julius Africanus, a military strategist and historian, born in Jerusalem in 180 AD, wrote a treatise advising the Roman Emperor Severus Alexander on tactics to adopt for his Persian War in 232 AD. He writes about a macabre device designed to drive horses mad by spraying a deadly poison into their faces. They'd be blinded, their, their noses would be stinging, their skin would be burning, and the riders would lose all control of the horses and thus lose their military efficiency. Africanus writes of a poison that is superior to all other methods of attack, more effective even than arrows. He does not specify the drug used, but past historians have suggested that the most likely culprit for the source of the poison is the plant known as the euphorbia. 
However, no practical investigations have ever been carried out to determine whether this is true. Until now. Kew in Britain is the world's center for plant toxicology. Here, Professor Monique Simmons believes the active toxic ingredients are in the sap of the plant, in this species known as the latex. If this latex gets into your, your eyes, it is incredibly painful. Latex is the milky sap found in many plants, such as dandelions. Not all forms of latex are poisonous. However, that found in the euphorbia species usually is. To test the toxins in the euphorbia plant, Monique must prepare a sample of the horrific ingredients. The resulting compound can be tested in a machine known as a mass spectrometer. This machine helps separate them and gives us kind of a profile of the compounds that are present. Monique is searching the sample for highly toxic substances known as esters. An ester is a complex organic compound found in a variety of toxins, such as those found in shellfish. We can see some here, and it looks like that these actually could be some of the, the esters that are associated with the toxicity. So if it was fired into the face of a horse, that would have been a really nasty irritant. The evidence suggests euphorbia is the culprit. Now, Richard Windley is investigating how this horrible agent was delivered to the horses. We think that one of the methods they may have used was to use um, a device which was probably commonly known, which was a kind of siphon pump. Richard wants to investigate whether the siphon will direct the poison at the horse, and most importantly, away from himself. From Africanus's text, we know that this gun was deployed by men placed within the front line, who would spray the poison into the noses of the horses once the enemy had reached them. The horses would go mad and throw their riders off, who, encumbered by their heavy armor, would be easily captured or killed. Well, um, that was a really interesting experiment. Um, we know how toxic this sap is from sort of laboratory experiments, but now I think we've proved that we've got a delivery system that will project this stuff at least, what, 20 to 30 feet. The difficult thing is, and it's always the case with, with, with poison weapons, if there's a sudden change in wind direction, you can cause absolute mayhem amongst your own side. Um, so that's obviously something that will have to be taken into account. In the right hands and with favorable winds, the horse poisoning gun would have sprayed its deadly contents into the ranks of ancient Greek cavalrymen. But the ancients' understanding of chemistry could produce even more stunning results on a much bigger scale. Over 2,000 years ago, a general called Hannibal led an army of men, horses, and elephants across the highest mountains in the known world sometimes by going over them, and sometimes, where the cliffs were impassable, using a secret forgotten formula to dissolve the rocks away in front of their very eyes. That's got to be one of the most successful experiments I've ever done for ancient discoveries. years ago, an invasion force of nearly 10,000 men and beasts successfully crossed these 15,000-foot-high mountains. In the ancient world, uh, and right the way through into the modern world, the best ways of defining your country's boundary are by fixed, identifiable geographical boundaries. Nations rely on these natural boundaries, safe in the knowledge that no sane general would or even could lead a major attacking force over their impossible peaks. A mountain range is difficult to get through. The altitude is high, it's cold, it's difficult, it's dangerous. It really does impose a huge strategic barrier to the movement of large armies. In 218 BC, Hannibal led a major invasion force of 80,000 men, 10,000 horses, and 38 war elephants across the Alps. His target, his mortal enemy, Rome. There are any number of easier ways of invading Italy than going over the Alps. It's, you know, it's the least likely option. 
In 218 BC, there were only two military powers in the known ancient world. To the north, the mighty Roman Empire. To the south, the great empire of the Carthaginians ranged across North Africa. War had been raging for decades as both superpowers vied for control of the valuable trade routes through the Mediterranean. In a bid to destroy Rome once and for all, Hannibal of the Carthaginians laid a bold plan. He would attack from the north, bringing his invasion force over the highest mountains in the known world. I'm used to mountains, but these are just awesome. John Naylor is an expert in ancient military tactics and equipment, as well as an experienced ex-forces climber. Yet he has only been on the mountain a few minutes, and he is discovering the magnitude of Hannibal's achievement. Even with modern equipment and modern clothing, the Alps can be a deadly place. You've got precipices you can step off and fall thousands of feet to your death. Rocks that block you away from landslides. This is a daunting, terrifying place, not where I'd like to bring an army. Therein lies the mystery. How did Hannibal's army cross the snowy peaks? We're not really sure what sort of equipment the Carthaginians would have had, but we've got lots of Roman references to the sort of equipment that was available at the time. Researchers must think outside the box. It's unlikely that the Romans had something which the Carthaginians didn't know about, or vice versa. And so we can assume that within the parameters of that kind of relationship, the equipment will be essentially similar. The investigation must continue 700 miles further south, in Rome. Home of the Colosseum, the Vatican, and literally thousands of ancient buildings and monuments. On one of these monuments, the Arch of Constantine, researchers have discovered a tiny fragment of evidence. It shows a piece of equipment strapped to the feet of a soldier. The device looks exactly like a modern crampon. The crampon is a spike device that straps to the bottom of a boot that allows modern climbers to gain purchase on snow, ice, and rocks. But this evidence suggests the ancients may have had them too. Boots, these are the Roman caligae, the marching boots. They've got hobnails in to protect them on the stones, on the rocks, stop them wearing out too quickly. Crampons, they're based on some from the Arch of Constantine. They're described in Roman accounts as spy boots. John wants to discover whether this ancient device is as effective as the modern one. With this sort of gear, maybe Hannibal's troops could have conquered this mountain. So we've got to come here and test it. Pierre, an experienced alpine climber, ensures John's safety rope is secure before he attempts the difficult climb up the icy cliff. Will the Roman spy shoes give John enough grip to get to the top? <sighs> Grazie. <laughs> that was surprisingly easy. When I first got the references to these spy shoes, I was very skeptical. But they really do work. Um, especially on that difficult transition of snow to rock. They were able to give me that extra little bit of traction which in just leather boots, I wouldn't have stood a chance. I wouldn't have liked to have tried it without the safety rope and Pierre, but the Carthaginians could have done it. John has climbed the Alps using 2,000-year-old technology, the prototypes of the equipment special forces still use today. Hannibal did manage to get over these Alps, and we've shown that with the most rudimentary equipment, it's possible with determination and grit. His men were real men, real soldiers. But then he faced the ultimate barrier. There were some passes that were simply unclimbable. The ancient texts record that as Hannibal descended the Roman side of the Alps, he was confronted with a massive precipice which he couldn't pass. The invasion was on the brink of disaster. But then his engineers proposed a remarkable solution they would destroy the very rock of the mountain using a surprisingly violent chemical formula. The high-tech chemical labs of the 21st century produce compounds so complicated, 
It would take this entire hour to list out the ingredients of just one of them. But there is evidence from the ancient writer Livy that ancient armies had a much better understanding of the power of chemistry than first thought. And they applied this on a scale much bigger than we use today, on whole mountainsides. In 232 BC, the Carthaginian general Hannibal successfully led an invasion force over these 15,000 foot high mountains, using equipment still used by climbers today. But then he got stuck. Hannibal finds that his way down off the mountain is obstructed by a huge block of stone. How can he get through this? He can't go around it and he can't go back. His army's gonna starve to death. Modern historians believe the blocked route to have been either the Clapier Pass or the Traverset Pass, both standing at over 8,000 feet. Livy tells us that a recent landslide had converted an already awkward spot into a perpendicular drop of nearly 300 feet, a limestone rock face that was completely impassable. Hannibal's first thought was to go back, but according to Livy, the way behind them had turned into an ice sheet that the army's animals couldn't cross. Hannibal had to press on. Today, engineers use dynamite to blast pathways and mega machines to smash their way through obstacles. Hannibal used heat and ingenuity. Now, rock's hard. If you heat it, it expands. If you cool it rapidly, it contracts. And that expansion and dramatic contraction causes it to shatter and break. In this state, I can't do anything with it. But if I heat it and cool it rapidly, it becomes what we call friable. It's softer, crumbly, easier to break through. Now, the way to test it is we're going to heat up a small sample first using a blowtorch and then rapidly cool it using water. After 15 minutes, the limestone is red hot. I've got a high temperature thermometer here, digital thermometer, to see just what temperature the rock's up to. At 479 degrees, the addition of cold water will drop the rock temperature by 3,000% in just seconds. It's fizzing and boiling. Oh, amazing. That water's dried off in front of my eyes. Now let's see what effect it's had on the structure of the rock. To the naked eye, it doesn't look any different to before we started, but what's it really like? Let's see. Oh, amazing. It's soft, it's like chalk. I guess this is what they mean when they say the rock becomes friable. But Livy is very specific. The texts state clearly that Hannibal called for vinegar, not water. Uh, vinegar, salad dressing, um, doesn't sound very dangerous, does it? Uh, you get the impression, though, that Livy is as reliable as he can be, so I suspect there's more than a grain of truth in it. Perhaps the ancients understood the secrets of chemical reactions better than modern scientists give them credit for. There's a possible reason why you used vinegar instead of water. Limestone's alkali, vinegar's acid. That means it's chemistry as well as physics. 3D analyst James Dean has been researching Livy's claim at a molecular level. If we zoom in, we can see that the key components in the reaction here are an acid and a base. In this example, the base is the rock, which is limestone, calcium carbonate, and the acid is the vinegar or acetic acid. This falls into a common class of reaction known as an acid-base reaction. If we can push the two together to start the reaction off, we can see that straight away the acid has released hydrogen ions, which are combining with the oxygen and hydrogen from the base to form H2O, or water. Uh, the remaining components combine together to form a salt, which we can see here. The whole reaction is exothermic, and it's giving off a lot of heat. So we can see that if we look back at the wider scale, the heat is heating the water and it's producing steam, which we can see coming off it. There's other gases produced if you've got carbon involved, which will give us carbon dioxide. That will give us the effervescence and bubbling. And overall, the entire structure of the rock has been destroyed. The salt and water now permeate it. And if we touch it, it's completely friable. For Hannibal, this was no chemistry experiment. 
It was a matter of life and death. Hannibal was facing the ultimate on pass. Just like now, night's falling, the temperature's dropping, his army is about to freeze to death and die with no way down to those fertile plains below. He's got to get away through the rock. We're going to attempt it now. Big fire on here. Heat the rock up with this fire, and then we'll try the vinegar and see whether we can make this rock friable enough to bash our way through and get down onto the plains. I've got the fire started. Now I need bigger sticks, logs, get this into a big raging inferno. Not only was this a huge 300-foot expanse of rock, but a very dangerous precipice as well. The fire would have been enormous, the progress painstaking, as Hannibal's men slowly worked their way down the rock face, creating a path for the animals. The temperature of the rock is now 1,200 degrees. But is this high enough to accelerate the acid base reaction? That is really hot. It's taking all the fur off my face. But I need to be able to get close enough to get the vinegar on. The size of the obstacle would probably have needed 20,000 gallons of vinegar. But where would this vast amount come from? Hannibal's troops would have had a daily sour wine ration of half a pint. The 80,000 strong army would still have had 21,000 gallons of wine vinegar with them. Oh, boy, look at that boiling off there. It smells disgusting. I can see the rock cracking in front of my eyes. It's boiling and steaming in here. The acid of the vinegar is burning the back of my throat. <coughs> I'm learning every moment that I'm doing this. It's as if this rock has become an organic living thing that's complaining about the treatment we've given it. Oh, I love the way that breaks. It's not a boulder anymore, is it? It's just a loose conglomeration of pebbles. Like John, Hannibal's men used picks to smash through the limestone, enabling them to open up a zigzag track that minimized the steepness, thus allowing the pack animals and elephants to descend. After four days of work and near starvation, Hannibal had done it. He had blasted his way through the Alps. That's got to be one of the most successful experiments I've ever done for ancient discoveries. Mountains you think of as the immovable object. Hannibal did it with some sticks, some salad dressing, some hard work and ingenuity. Absolutely staggering. Hannibal plowed through Italy down into Rome and inflicted the severest losses the Roman army ever suffered in its entire history. But although coming over the Alps allowed him the element of surprise, it ultimately was the cause of Hannibal's downfall. It's ironic that Hannibal used the best technology available to him to, to do this insurmountable task of getting an army over these mountains. But in that, he didn't have the capability to bring his heavy equipment with him. When it came to taking the towns through fortifications without siege machines, which he couldn't bring over these mountains, he was on a hopeless task. Technology allowed him to get there, but then the door was slammed in his face. Machines such as the carbon flamethrower, the catapults, and other siege engines were too important to have been left behind, and Hannibal's campaign failed. He doesn't attack cities, he doesn't capture places. Rome is there, and he doesn't attack it. Whether through learning from failure or spectacular successes, the engineers of the ancient world were no different to those of today. Ancient engineers faced exactly the same problems as we face today. You're wanting to go faster and carry more, but use less natural resources in terms of making it, and then want it to perform for a long time once it's constructed. Some inventions turned the tide of great battles and shaped history and the world we live in today. Others pushed the envelope of invention too far, and while they continued to amaze, were probably ineffective in battle. 
As the mysteries of ancient engineering continue to be revealed, the modern world must question how much of what we take for granted owes a debt to the ingenuity of the ancients and their impossible army machines. <laughs>